know him, this is Matthew. Hello, Matthew. Shall we pray for Matthew? Lord, we thank you for Matthew. <laughs> we pray that you'll speak through him today. We thank you for all that you're doing in his heart. Thank you for all that's going on in his life, Lord God. We pray your blessing of upon him as he speaks and our blessing upon us as we hear what you've got to say this morning we pray in jesus name amen, amen. thank you right, yeah thank you hello got um joel made me a present my son this morning he's only four he said i've made you a sword to hold while you're talking and i said is it the sword of truth or the sword in the spirit he said no it's the sword from the stone so <laughs> So it's there. I said I was going to look at it while I was talking, so I have, you see. And uh, I was looking for some photos, because I'm talking a bit today about our relationship with God and how he comes into our life and how we, we come to know him a little bit and what baptism means. Okay, so I'm going to go a bit more into that as well. But I was looking at photos. I wanted some photos of being married or just me and Cheryl, really, because I'm kind of using that our marriage is an illustration of, of commitment kind of thing, you know. And uh, I was just looking at photos that we had. We only moved house this week, so I don't know where most of our photos are, so it was a bit of a waste of time. But I just, Robbie's not back yet, but I just had this, just came across this picture of me and Joel that Michael took last year. And uh, this is Joel who's done me the sword, and it sits on one of our bookcases on the landing. And it just, just had this picture, actually, of that being... He's not here, I'll tell him afterwards, of that being Robbie and that being God. And actually, I just had this picture of this beautiful, shiny frame in God's house on the mantelpiece. And Jesus was just dusting it, ready for his father to come in and say, look, father, one of your sons is home. He, and just God the father staring and looking at this photo of him and Robbie and just smiling, knowing that his son was home again. And then I looked up, and there was just this mantelpiece. You've never seen a mantelpiece like it. It just went on for miles and miles and miles. And I can guarantee if I stood at that mantelpiece and looked at every photo, and I was in a bit of a rush because Chantelle had just turned up to pick us up for church, but I could just guarantee if I'd walked along and looked at each and every one of those photos, you would have all been on there. Everyone here as a precious child of God. Jesus going along one by one and just praying for you and just bringing you to the Father and saying... I've brought your child home for your father, because that was his mission. And, uh, you know, Robbie's got a powerful testimony. I just wanted to share a bit of mine, just because I felt it was a bit relevant to what we're talking about. But um, I kind of had a similar path to Robbie. I didn't become a Christian until I was about 30. I'm 42 now, so I've been saved about 12 years. Uh, apologies, because quite a few people in the room have probably heard me talk about it already, but... I don't care. Um, <laughs> it's good not to care, isn't it, Dave? Um, so I um, was in a relationship. I had two children. I had kind of a troubled mindset. I wasn't um, a very easy person to live with, let's put it that way. Uh, and as things got worse and worse, I started to drink more and more. Um, kind of just started not being at home very much, things like that. And in the end, my ex-partner said, I just can't live with you and raise two children at the same time. Please, can you leave? And I left. And I took it as the ultimate rejection. For a little while, I didn't have the insight to see that actually I was pretty much responsible for that situation. But over time, um, I left. I got a flat in some nursing accommodation in Manchester where I worked. And I just drank more and more. Uh, managed to go to work and look after people without any unhappy accidents, fortunately. Um, but I just started getting into more and more of a negative mindset and I became obsessed with the thought of taking my own life. Uh, and I was getting closer and closer to that point. I had a little tablet collection for the day and that day kind of came and I just, before I t you know, could get there, I suddenly thought, my parents have got to come and tidy up this place. So I started boxing up some stuff and throwing it in the bins outside because I just didn't want them to find certain things from my life or, you know, I just wanted to look better than I was, I guess. But as I did so, I came to a box. And in the bottom of this empty box was the little Gideon's Bible that they give you on your first day at high school. 
And for some reason, um, I went and got a beer, and I sat down, and I started, and I opened it, and it said the book of Matthew, because it was a New Testament, and I thought, oh, I'm really sick of Matthew. I just, all I could see was all the things I'd done wrong, how I'd screwed up the lives of my ex-partner, how I'd screwed up the lives of my family, how my kids weren't going to have the chances in life, because I just had a very negative view of myself and all that I'd done. Some of it was very justified. And... Uh, I thought, I don't want to read the book of Matthew. I'm sick of him. So I turned, and I must have missed Mark, because I came to the book of Luke. And as I started reading it, drinking my beer and reading the Bible, um, I just started to become more and more sure that there was a God. I became more and more sure that God was in the room with me. And as I went on and on, and I read the words of Jesus, I became absolutely convinced that if I took my life there and then, that I wasn't going to go to a good place. That was it. There'd be no way back. But I also became very convinced that actually if I lived, there was a God, and my life was an offence to him at that point. Um, I didn't know what to do. It was kind of between a rock and a hard place, so I just kept on reading. And I got to the story of um, a sinful woman coming in and anointing Jesus, she comes in, I preached on it last time I preached, I think, she comes in and she just cries tears on his feet, washes his feet, um, and Jesus says, your faith has saved you, and he says about those who love little, uh, those who are forgiven little, love little, and I just felt God say, you've sinned so much, but I forgive it all, and I love you so much, and I'm going to use you to love much, and I just felt God's presence and God's power just pour on me to the point that I actually just slid off my chair onto the floor and I felt him say do you want me do you want me and I just lay on the floor sobbing and crying and saying I want you yes I want you and I'd never really considered God before that moment I don't know why maybe that was the only time in my life I would have listened is by getting to that point I would have accepted him and all the reasons I had in my life up to that point for not considering God, for saying I wouldn't have liked him if he was real, all the things that just stopped me ever going there, looking at him, just dissolved. And just like I always used to say, I'm never getting married. Who wants to be married? Who wants to be stuck with the same person for the rest of your life? Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> I just noticed she's come back in the room. I thought she was in crash. sorry. But I never wanted to be married. But then when I met Cheryl, those reasons actually weren't relevant anymore. None of it mattered. It was just not something that crossed my mind. And I remember the first time I met Cheryl, we actually met online. Um, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit because I'm going to talk about her. And we came to know each other online and we used to chat on the phone. And then we agreed to meet. And for the week before we met, and you're always going to meet me in a week's time, that's the only week of my life where I've done push-ups and sit-ups every day. <laughs> she lived in Cumbria, and I lived down in Macclesfield, about three and a half hours apart. But she had this thing arranged with her friend. You know where some of the ladies here might have gone? Someone offers you a free photo shoot with cakes and a fizzy alcoholic drink and you go and they take photos and then they try and sell you those photos. Well, Cheryl had been given one of them with a friend and they were doing that in Manchester. So she said, do you want to meet us in Manchester afterwards, me and my friend? I thought, that's a good idea. Um, so we did. Ch um, Cheryl and her friend Jenny. So we meet, we've been chatting for weeks on the phone and we really get on on the phone. We, we really just talking all the time. Um, and then we meet, and she's been for this photo shoot. So what I didn't realise, she turns up, and she's orange. <laughs> I mean, she really looks like she's just been tangoed. And I don't know, we've all got different likes and dislikes, but I'm not, I've never put on my, I didn't put on my internet dating page, I'm looking for an orange lady. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And she's shy. Has anyone noticed that? About my lovely wife, who's probably squirming in a seat right now because I keep talking about her. I'm enjoying this, but she's not. 
She's shy, so she doesn't say much. So I spent the next three hours as we walked around Manchester and we went on the Manchester wheel and then we went to the noodle place, I've forgotten what it's called, that noodle chain, and had a meal, Wagamama, that's it, Wagamama. And we had a meal, I spent those whole three hours talking to Jenny. <laughs> and Cheryl followed us just behind. We did speak of it though, didn't we? Um, which might have been the end of it, but I didn't let the orange put me off. I decided I was going to give her another chance. <laughs> we're going to someone's house for lunch afterwards, so we're going to be in public, so I'm hoping I'm going to be all right. So I decided to give her another chance, and we meet the following week in a pub in Lancaster, because it's halfway in between, and Cheryl went to uni in Lancaster, so she knew Lancaster. It was a, a good, safe place for her. And we meet, and she's got no makeup on. But, and I just sit there and stare. Seriously, two hours in a pub with me going, and every half an hour going, you're gorgeous. You can ask her, that's serious how the night went. Fortunately for her, some teachers she used to work with were having their do or something there, so people kept coming up to speak to her because I wasn't doing much talking. I was so besotted with this woman sat before me who I knew was really nice. It wasn't that just her physical presence, it just matched who we'd been speaking to on the phone. Does that make sense? So, but I was so besotted, I couldn't speak. But fortunately, she gave me another chance. And how we come to see God, to me, is a bit like that. I didn't grow up going to church. I heard things through distant family and things that we'd had distant family who'd gone to church. They weren't nice people. Um, they'd had this characteristic or that. That's what Christians were like. That's what I'd heard. I'd heard that God, through friends, I'd been told, oh, God's a killjoy. That it's just about religion. And if actually you're a strong person, you don't need God because you just get on and do your own thing. And I saw someone as God, I saw God as someone who, if he was real, I wasn't really going to like him. I wouldn't like him. And he wouldn't like me because I don't go to church and I wasn't a goody two-shoes and I wanted to spend my 20s getting drunk and chasing girls. That was pretty much my life's ambition. God would stop me doing these things. Oh, I just remember, look, that's the picture she sent me in the post before we met. It's not very orange, is it? You see, I've still got that in my wallet. But then God came into my life, and it wasn't like a God that I'd heard about. It was God, the God himself, who showed himself to me. And after I lay on the floor, after coming to, to know him, I was suddenly am amazed by how loving and caring and graceful and kind, forgiving, how tender he was. These weren't the things I'd heard about. This wasn't the God that I thought I knew. I felt the weight of all the empty things I'd ever thought about anything in my life, all my selfish ambitions and my sin and my shame, all of it just went off me. This was God. He took all this away. And I realized that I'd been seeing him with makeup that other people had put on him. I looked at him and I saw him as orange and not liking orange. But he showed himself to me. We met and he didn't have any makeup on. And God, without the makeup that other people put on him, is just beautiful. He was mine and I was his. And a little while after staring at Cheryl, our next date was I'd brought tickets to the Halley Orchestra at Tatton Park, because I really wanted to impress her now. And we got there, and I walked in, and Cheryl walked next to me, carrying, I don't know, I wrote a list, the picnic, the blankets, the chairs, the wine, and the painkillers. Because a few days before this date, I'd had my appendix out. Now, as a nurse, I can tell you, if you had your appendix out, you certainly shouldn't be walking through fields on a cold night to go and sit on a picnic chair and watch an orchestra. It really, really hurt. 
I, had to, I was walking like this all the time just to try and keep the pain in. But I tell you, nothing, nothing was going to stop me going on this date and spending an evening with this woman and trying to impress her with the fireworks and this amazing concert. I said to recently, Cheryl to Cheryl, do you remember when, when we met and we used to stay up till one or two in the morning just chatting on the phone all night? And do you know what she said? No. <laughs> she said, I remember when you used to stay up till one or two in the morning chatting. She just listened. But I'd met this girl, and I thought about her all the time, and I wanted to know more about her, and I just wanted to spend time with her. And so I didn't let things like pain and discomfort or three and a half hour drives put me off. And for weeks after becoming a Christian, all I could think about was this new closeness to God. I kept reading the Bible because I could see it was him speaking to me. It was him telling me about himself. It was him telling me about me and us and our new relationship. It was him telling me everything he was gonna do in my life. Everything. I started reevaluating everything I thought I knew about life and the world suddenly changed. The makeup had come off. I belonged to God and nothing stopped me from wanting to know him. You know, family were worried about me. Oh no, what's happened? Friends were like, whoa, Matthew, it's probably a cult. If, it's, if, you, if you've had that intense a change in you, it's probably a cult. They've brainwashed you or hypnotized you. Something's happened. It's not, it can't be right. People told me I'd been brainwashed. I, I met God and I didn't want to stop being with him. I didn't want to stop meeting him. I didn't want to stop getting to know him. And... The next thing with me and Cheryl, because it was a bit of a whirlwind romance, is I met Cheryl in June, online, in person in July, and I had my appendix out in August, but then in September I was better. They said you need to go to work. So two things came into play. First one was I really liked this girl, and I could not see that changing. And the second thing was I was really fed up of driving up and down that motorway all the time. Now. If I'd had to have kept driving up and down the motorway, she was worth every trip, every mile, trust me. But how much easier would it be if she was closer, like in my house, like all the time? How much easier would it be? Now, bearing in mind, I knew she was a keeper. In September, I took my three-year-old son to a jeweler's and we chose an engagement ring. And I proposed. And can you believe it? She said, yes. We well, can believe it because she's here. But you can believe she's crazy, can't you? I was looking at, we were showing the kids wedding photos on our last wedding anniversary, and there's like my two eldest sons who still have a relationship with, fortunately. They, they were there, and they're, you know, they're younger than even Joel are now. And you think she married me with two young kids. She took me and my kids on like that. And it's just amazing. It must have been crazy. I must have been very charming without my orange makeup. But I make it sound like impulsive. It wasn't. I actually went to Anglesey for a week on my own and prayed and spent time with God and went on this little island off of Anglesey and just came away with a real sense of peace that actually, yes, God was in this. And, you know, so it wasn't quite as impulsive as a man, although it was only a few months. So we got married in March and that was over nine years ago and she still puts up with me. She still says she's happy to be married with me. Now, I would never, ever, ever let my daughter marry someone that quickly. And I don't recommend it as being the best way to do courtship, but I do relate it to how we get to know God. If we get that glimpse of how amazing he is, how awesome he is, how great it would be just to be in that relationship with him, how he has all those positive feelings for us too, if we get that, we should take hold of it and say, yes, Lord, I want you now, and I want you forever. Because as much as I love Cheryl, and I know she's a good wife, and she is one of the best things that's happened to me, nothing, nothing surpasses the knowledge of being known and loved by God. And she won't mind me saying that, I'm sure. Of knowing that he loves you, 
And it's not that he just wants to recognize you exist and then make your life a misery. He lived on the earth. He spread a message of his love and a new hope for all people. And then he died on a cross to prove it and to make a direct relationship with God possible. And he gives us his spirit to make that real and to help us reach others with the same message. And another point about marriage, and then we'll stop talking about marriage in a minute, is that I've been married to Cheryl now for nearly 10 years. And all the things I knew about how she would be as a wife, I found to be true. But I actually know it from experience now. I've actually seen it and so much more. I've seen her give birth three times. I've seen her keep loving our kids day after day despite them not letting her sleep the night before. She's cared for me through illness and being incapacitated last year and things like that. We've mourned together, we've lost together and we've laughed at things that no one else is going to understand. Those are the things that I knew were coming up but you can't appreciate until you're actually there in that relationship. And all the things I knew when I stepped into that relationship with God, I now know more fully because he's walked through the last 12 years with me. He's walked me through my character faults. He's led me through anger. He's led me through addictions. He's taught me how to, to love others more and think a little bit less about myself. I'm still working on that. He's taught me how to trust him. So we enter this gift, we entered this gift called marriage, and marriage gives two people the ch- chance to commit to each other before God, to a life together, and to put another person's life in front of their own. Effectively, two people die as individuals and become one person together. And I didn't understand it until I got married and had to live it. And it's really difficult, but it's really rewarding. And how much easier would it be if at least one of us was perfect. I used to think it was me, but it turns out I'm not. I always thought I was a really nice guy till I got married and then I found out I'm not at all. In the Bible, God uses marriage as an illustration of his relationship with us. He uses a lot of different um, allegories or whatever the word is, illustrations. But one of them is a groom to the bride. Um, He shows himself as the groom and we as the church, but also in some illustrations, he means us as people, we're his bride. Jesus shows his commitment to us, he's done it. He's shown his commitment to us by living a life perfectly, dying on a cross, destroying the barrier between our sins and our shame and what they, the barrier that they put between us and God. He gives us his Holy Spirit, as I've said, so that we can know that's all true. He's shown his absolute love to you. He gave himself and died as an illustration of what, well, just to show, not even an illustration, to show his love for you, his devotion. So with that, he's down on one knee, not literally, he's down on one knee proposing with eternal life, with sonship with God, with that perfect relationship with him, as the diamond ring to put on your finger. His proposal is, will you do the same? Will you die to yourself, as Robbie's acknowledged this morning? Will you die to who you were? Will you let your old self die and join with him into a new life forever? We we signify our acceptance of that offer through baptism. Baptism is us, there's other things, I'm just talking about baptism this morning, but we put our flag in the ground and say, I know I've been made new in God. To the Jews of Jesus' day, this is where I get a little bit teachy, but it won't last long, don't worry. To the Jews of Jesus' day, baptism was humiliation. Um, Baptism was for non, if you weren't a Jew and you wanted to become a Jew, it was really hard. You had to learn a lot of the law, you had to be circumcised, and you had to be baptized. To say to a Jew they needed to be baptized was to suggest they weren't one of God's chosen people, and they knew they were. It was, it was quite scandalous at the time to say to a Jew, you need to be baptized. So when Jesus turns up to be baptized, and John says, 
you can't, I can't baptize you. It's really, it is quite scandalous. I'm not sure we always get that when we read the Bible. Jesus says, no, this needs to be done. I need you to baptize me because he won't do anything. That he, he won't ask us to do anything that he wouldn't do. But this is what Jesus, baptism is what Jesus has given us to help us show our new faith in him. We say that we accept Jesus and a baptism is a chance then to demonstrate to God and his people and to ourselves that we mean what we say. So Jesus says, do you love me and give over your entire life to me? Are you prepared to die to who you are? He says, believe and be baptized. I might say, well, I give you my life. I'll, I'll do what you ask but I don't want to get baptized. Jesus says, actually I'm not saying Jesus says this actually. There's an argument that if you're saying I give my life to you Jesus and then he says, okay, be baptized and you say, I don't want to be baptized. There could be an argument, why not? You've just said to Jesus, I'll do anything you tell me to do Jesus and he's just said, be baptized. Why would we then not want to reciprocate. So just as people often seek the fun side of marriage without the covenant, some people hope for a relationship with Jesus while secretly not really committing to him. A rich ruler came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I do this, this, and this. What else do I need to do? And Jesus said, go and give away everything you own. And the rich ruler left because he realized that he held something higher than God in his life because he couldn't do what he knew he needed to do. Jesus is not afraid to show us the things that we put above him in our lives when we say that we want him to be the most important thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So just as you can't have a good marriage where two people refuse to move forward together in things, so a relationship with God can't work if we're not following his leadership. It gives us this chance, as I've said, to see whether what we're saying is true or not. He gives us a chance to test our love for him so that we can see it's real or not. And baptism is an early opportunity to show that faith is genuine. I want to give my life to you, Jesus, then be baptized. Well, I don't like cold water, and it might offend my parents, and my hair would look really bad in public afterwards. Jesus is more important. Right. Baptism shows we're wanting to go where God is going to take us on his terms, that we really will follow Jesus anywhere and any way. So just to be clear... We're not Christians because we got baptized. We get baptized because we're Christians. Baptism follows faith. Baptism doesn't create faith. Baptism doesn't save us in any way. Jesus saves us. And over time, baptism isn't the only way someone is committed to Jesus. So you don't say I'm baptized, that's it, I've done it all. Jesus has done it all anyway, so that's not a good argument, but we see character change. As Robbie said this morning, the way his heart has changed, the way he seeks things has changed. The man he is has changed already. Rob. Amen. We grow in the fruits of the spirits. We see ourselves and other people becoming more loving. We see our lives becoming more about him and his mission. These things don't save us. They come out from being saved. We're made right with God by the death of Jesus and his victory over sin and death. He makes it possible for us to approach God and to know him. We can't look to ourselves and our own actions. We can't say, oh, there's no inherent thing in baptism where we get baptized and we can hold that up to God and say, look at me. It's just a pool of water. But it's amazing that the process of baptism reflects how Christ saved us and also reflects how we came to union with God. We saw Robbie 
lowered back into the water as a sign of dying with Jesus on the cross where he took all our sin and the punishment for sin and he took the distance between us and God and he buried it. He took all that and killed it on the cross. And we, we've avoided that horrible, sin-filled, lonely death and distance from God. Because Jesus died for us. I mean, it's just amazing. We can actually die with full assurance and in the presence of our Heavenly Father and feel the Holy Spirit. Jesus actually gave that up. On the cross, I don't think, you know, the hardest thing wasn't necessarily the torture and the pain. It was like for the first time in his whole life, he'd, he had this distance between him and the Father. He wasn't aware of his presence because he was sin. And sin can't be in the presence of God. So how did his heart break there for us, taking that distance for us? That's buried as well. We don't have to be distant from God. He's here with us now. We can know him in everything. And as we go into the water, we're saying, thank you, Jesus, that you died for me, that you've done this for me. And I've also died to myself. I died to everything I wanted my life to be, everything that I was trying to make my life, and I accept your forgiveness. And I let go of all my shame and all my hatred, and I thank you that there's now no barrier between me and God. And that moment where we're under the water, we don't leave people under there for three days, fortunately, but being under the water relates to Jesus dead in the tomb, buried and no longer alive. We spent three days there. Our sin starting to rot. Our shame starting to rot. Our distance to God buried in the ground. Our old life, our old person gone. And then that beautiful moment where you breathe again, you're raised up out of the water, clean, completely clean, Alive, new. Just as Jesus rose from the dead to a new life and a new body, we also have new life in him. We have the Holy Spirit in us, uniting us to God, leading us in our new life. And a new life now. It's not like just a promise for heaven. You know, we're living that life now, that new identity. We are a photo on our Father's frame but not just so he can look at us you know I don't have a photo of my son on the frame and then don't ever go and play with him do you know what I mean oh I want to engage with Joel today I'm going to go and look at his photo on the shelf no I'll go and spend time with him you know God just hasn't just put your name in the book of life and he shut the book he knows you're there and he'll see you later bump into you in heaven one day he's fully engaged with knowing each and every one of us right now For all of us, our baptism is a symbol of our acceptance of Jesus and our belief in who he is and what he's done for us. That our old self is dead and buried and that our new self has been raised with Christ. I've been married now for going back to marriage 10 years nearly. We've had some great highs. We've had some big lows. Um, we've enjoyed good times together we've enjoyed difficult times together we've both had to forgive each other and move on but whether it's a high day or a low day or just can't be bothered day you're still married you're still trusting you're still hoping and when I got married I said I was going to focus all my intimacy all my thoughts my relationship energy so to speak I was going to focus that on just Cheryl. I was no longer going to seek intimacy with another person or, you know, there were things I was going to keep exclusive to marriage that we were going to build a life together. I wasn't going to seek to build something with someone else. But I wasn't giving anything up. You could say, oh, but, you know, what? you can't do this now you're married and you can't do that now you're married and you can't do that. That's not the focus The focus is what you've actually got. And 
As I said earlier about meeting Cheryl, and the more you get to know someone, the deeper it becomes. It's the same in faith. The longer that we know Jesus, the deeper that relationship becomes. And I don't think now, back on my relationship, of the thing, what, what did I give up when I followed Christ? I don't even remember. I talk about things I used to do, and all of it just seems so shallow and empty because I've got Jesus. I've got Jesus, what else is there? It just, and I think before I became a Christian, like talking about the orange makeup before, the thought of being out to drink when I wanted, well, I could still drink if I wanted to. I do have the odd drink, do you know what I mean? Or chasing girls, it just seems so empty and so shallow when God's got such better things for you, do you know what I mean? And being out to do what I want whenever I feel like it, well, it didn't get me very far, did it? And you just, you know, God's given me so much. He's given me peace. He's given me a constant assurance that he's with me. He's, I mean, he amazes me with his provision day after day in all things, in temperament and financial and just, just Holy Spirit speaking to me all the time. And I don't think, you know, I can't imagine life without it now. But God has that for everyone here. Whatever your needs are, whatever healing you need in yourself. I mean, we, we heard Robbie talk about drugs and seeking drugs, but actually, when he comes to God, losing its meaning. And I think of the same with drink and other things before I became a Christian. God can heal those things in us. God has that for us because he brings us peace and he brings us comfort and he brings us assurance and he brings us a knowledge of a new life in him and he gives us the power to live that out. But he won't just force it on you. And I've said this before, I think, here, but it's like he's offering you a gift. Jesus has, has he's done his side. He's died. He's, he's risen to new life. Right now, he's praying for you in heaven to the Father. And the Spirit is here carrying out those prayers. And God offers you salvation. He offers you his peace. He offers you his love. He offers you a part in his mission. He offers you... Whatever you want, you know, whatever he's got for you. But if I come to you with a gift and I say, Would you like that, Jan? And you say, Yes, but you just sit there and you don't take it off me. You don't get the gift. You don't get to do anything with it. You've got to open the gift. You've got to unpack it. You've got to play with it. You've got to step into actually owning it. And I just feel this morning there's people here. They know about Jesus, that you know what he's been doing, you know what he's done, you understand the, the gospel, you, but you've, you wonder why it's not doing anything for you. You wonder why when someone talks about having their life changed by God, why am I still struggling with this and that? And I just feel God just wanting to reach out to someone or some people this morning and say, well, you, you're not accepting the gift I'm giving you. You're not actually saying, yes, I want that, and therefore I don't want that. If you're here today and you don't know him, he's already given you all of himself. You might, you might be there waiting for some big sign for the words, I should have got them written up or something to come on the screen saying, I want you. Jesus said that on the cross when he died and when he rose to new life and he sent the disciples out across the world. He knew where you were gonna be and who you were gonna be and he knew you were gonna be listening right now. He's given you all of himself. He's done it. There's nothing else more that he needs to do for you. And he's asking you, will you trust him? Will you trust him and do the same? Will you agree in your heart and your mind to let go of everything else so that you can gain everything with him? And I'm going to just close if that's all right no. talk for long enough and no. plenty we can sing it's probably nice isn't it would the band like to come up and just the band are going to come up we're going to worship again and I hope there was something in there this morning that's just made people want to worship God a bit but uh, I just I just feel this there's people here that have never made that, taken that acceptance of what Jesus has done for them. 
or that there's people here who've taken that acceptance in the past and you've kind of sat back a bit and it's been floating around in the back of your mind, but actually you're not living it at the moment. You, don't, you haven't got that closeness to God. You've got people around you who, who you can see have got it. You see Robbie or Rob get up at the front and give his testimony and you think, I remember that. Why are you remembering it? You can have it today. It's still yours. It, God's mercies are fresh and new every day. It's as much for you today as the day you got saved, as the day you got baptised. And just as we worship now, if you, if you just want to come up to the front while we're singing, you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never said, actually, I accept what you've done for me, Jesus. I just want to invite you to just come to the front and pray to him in acceptance. I'm not going to ask you to stand up now. You may be someone who's in the past made a commitment to Christ, but actually you realise you're not really following through. That actually there's things that you keep in the way, that like the rich young ruler, you said yes to Jesus, but actually there was things you've kept back from him. God may have spoken to you this morning about baptism. You may want to arrange another baptism so that you can be baptised. Just speak to Rick or Dave, but probably Rick. And uh, just let him know, actually, I want to be baptised. You could do it now if you really want to. Just come and tell us. Water's still cold enough. Best to do it in cold water. It shows proper commitment. And it may be this morning that you feel like you've seen God a little bit without his orange makeup on and you don't feel ready to make a commitment but you think actually maybe there is more to this God than I thought in the past it may be that you want to look at it a bit more and I've got good news for you guys since October we start a new Alpha course and if you want to come and talk about Jesus who he is, why he died how you can have faith if you if you want to look into it more deeply, we've got places for you waiting. All right. Thank you.
Oh